Uh, right, okay, let's make a start. So um, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to our webinar today on marine protected areas and management for the Southwest Marine Ecosystems 2021. Okay, I'm just looking, we've got 100 participants, so I'm just going to crack straight on. We've got a really packed schedule today. So my name is Dr Emma Sheehan. I'm an Associate Professor of Marine Ecology at the University of Plymouth. And uh, University of Plymouth is hosting today. Uh, I'm honoured to chair this first session on marine protected areas where we have four brilliant presentations covering examples of the latest MPA research and projects around the Southwest. We will then have a short break before I hand over to Dr. Sean Rees, who is chairing the second session, which is focusing on management. Um, Bob Bell has asked me to remind you that this webinar is part of the Southwest Marine Ecosystems 2021 and will contribute towards the annual report that will be made available later in the year. So please do get in touch via the Southwest Marine Ecosystems website if you would like to contribute any observations that you've made over this last year. So before we start, um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. So thank you. We've got Alistair is our tech guy who'll be host, um, making this all work seamlessly today. So. Um, just so you know, we are recording this session um, so that we can post the whole session on the Southwest Marine Ecosystems YouTube channel um, and that will be available for, um, for everybody to watch. So you will be kept on mute with your video off throughout the event. If you have any technical issues, please email events at plymouth.ac.uk, which will be monitored. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions about the presentation. This will be monitored by the presenting academics and chair. And if you ask the question, your name will be visible to other attendees. But if you would prefer, you can ask questions anonymously. The chat function is also available to facilitate discussion amongst yourselves throughout the event. And this will not be used to inform the Q&A sessions. So if you, if you can see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, if you would like to suggest a question that I will pose to the speakers after each presentation, please do use that. And also you can vote on other people's questions um, that will help me to prioritize which ones. As I said, it is a packed schedule. We've only got a few minutes after each speaker. So I'll do my best to make sure we get the, um, the most important questions posed to them. Okay, let me just check. I think I think that's everything that I have to tell you. So um, bang on time, it's time for me to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker today is B Davies from the University of Plymouth and he's presenting the effect of a recovering marine protected area on taxonomic and functional diversity. So I'll hand over to you B. Thank you very much Emma. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the effectiveness of uh, partially protected marine areas for ecosystem-based management. Um, this is a project, well, the, this my PhD has been based on uh, looking at the Lime Bay data set uh, that's been collected by Emma and the team the last 12 years with uh, uh, funding from different sources. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So first of all, I'm going to go through a little bit of background about Lime Bay. Um, why it was protected, um, how it was protected, and then how it's been monitored, the different methods that have been used to monitor it, um, and some of the results that we're finding from these, uh, these uh, monitoring methods. And then looking a bit more at the management implications, but also um, some of the lessons that we've learned as a team, but also we, we think are applicable to um, the wider marine protected area uh, monitoring research groups. So uh, next slide. So uh, Lime Bay is on the southwestern uh, UK, um, it's a large embayment and is a biodiversity hotspot. So it has a lot of Annex 1 reef habitats, um, but also quite a few other habitats such as um, mudstone reefs and um, some sea caves in Tor Bay and some other areas. So um, the whole site of uh, Lime Bay, which was a statutory instrument created in 2008, was um, 
was created to prohibit the use of mobile demersal fishing across the whole site that you can see with the in the map here with the black line, um, meaning that across the reef areas, but also um, the in between sediment um, and sandy areas, there was also no pro, um, mobile demersal fishing allowed. And this uh, happened in 2008 um, to do with the accumulation of lots of conservationists, researchers and stakeholders, fishers in the area, all um, decided, well, not everyone, but everyone, there was a, a large group of people that wanted this to happen. This was created in 2008. And at the same time, the University of Plymouth started um, an annual benthic monitoring um, regime that uh, looked to carry out um, monitoring every single year using uh, two, well, a few different methods. I'm going to talk about two of them today. Um, so next slide. Um, so the two different methods I'm going to be talking about today are the toad flying array, which you can see in the top left hand corner, and baited remote underwater video systems that you can see on the bottom left hand corner. So both these methods are uh, non-destructive and non-extractive methods of sampling the sea, uh, the benthic environment, um, and can both be deployed quite easily from uh, fishing vessels, which we do each year from uh, fishers within line. We, we use their boats to deploy our quit kit and equipment to carry out our work. So the toad flying array uh, flies above the seabed um, to, to create a video transect, a high definition video transect to study all the sessile and sedentary fauna that are visible on the sea floor. Whereas the baited remote underwater video systems are a single camera that's dropped, it's stationary, and any um, organisms that are either nearby or attracted to the bait are enumerated. So mobile species is the idea of that one. So next slide, please. Early on uh, within the research of the um, bay, uh, Emma, Emma and the team found that um, there was lots of benefits being seen quite quickly in the sessile and sedentary species that were there. There was increases in species richness, total abundance, um, and assemblage composition of reef associated species that were in the area. So these there was an increase in these species um, in the first three years on the reef um, locations that we, we were being surveyed. But then also when looking at the areas between the reefs, so uh, the non-reef sites that potentially in a feature protection wouldn't have been protected, um, there was an increase in the reef associated species, meaning that actually these sandy or sediment, uh, sedimentary habitats were or must be um, hard rock or bedrock underneath uh, for the species to attach to, and therefore we can, uh, they, they saw that the function extent of the reef increased after this protection, after only three years of protection. So my work has been to uh, look at the whole data set after 12 years. Uh, next slide. And so first of all, I would like to talk about the mobile species. So um, over 11 years from the baited video, we saw that there was an increase in the exploited fish um, taxa. Um, that's the top left hand corner, the number of taxa, and then the bottom left hand corner of the graphs is the total abundance of the exploited fish taxa. And we found that actually the, the number of taxa that we were using as a diversity metric um, increased significantly in both the MPA and the open controls. Um, but the, the rate of increase in the MPA was over twice that of the open controls, whereas the total abundance, the MPA and the open controls significantly increased over time at a very similar rate. What was interesting for us was that we also found that the non-exploited fish tax, which the, the right hand two graphs, both the number of taxa and the total abundance significantly decreased over time in the MPA, whether this to do with competition or um, differences in the ratios of which species were being called exploited. We're still, we're still looking into this now. Uh, so next slide. But then we wanted to look at the, um, the change in the ecosystem that we had surveyed through the toad video and the benthic, um, uh, the mobile species from the, the baited videos um, together and see how actually the, the change in the ecosystems that we had been seeing, what, what, what was causing this change? So we looked at um, the functional traits and some metrics to do with that. So these data here, are, uh, like I say, it's a co combination of the toad video and the mobile, uh, the 
baited video. Um, and we found that um, looking at a few different functional traits, we could see different changes going on within the ecosystem. So first of all, on the left side, you can see that um, the change in the functional richness, which without going into too much detail about the methods, um, is a way of looking at how many different uh, unique functional traits are within an ecosystem. So, um, and it's been heavily linked to ecosystem services and then also community stability, which actually we found within the MPA significantly re increased over time in relation to the open controls that we were surveying as well. Then when looking at um, the functional divergence, we looked, uh, we found that um, there was a decrease in the MPA. This metric can be thought of as, well, it's, it's to do with the abundance of uh, functionally rare species. So, so certain traits that an organism might have that are on the periphery of the community and therefore are rare. So there could be a few different um, reasons for us seeing a decrease in this value, but what is most likely is going on is that actually the, the abundance and relative amount of um, what we were classing or would be classed as rare tax were becoming less and less rare and therefore the abundances of them was decreasing which saw this decrease and then finally which i think i i think is the most interesting find of um this research is looking at functional redundancy so this is to do with um looking at the overlap of functional traits across species so <clears throat> the functional redundancy has been linked to the resilient perturbations such as storms biological invasions and disruptive fishing because when, um, for example, if, if a species goes regionally extinct with an area, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the traits that that organism has and therefore the, the ecosystem services that it can provide from those traits, those traits don't necessarily go extinct at the same time because there might be other organisms with the same traits. Um, so by sort of law of averages that if there are more if there's more overlap of traits it's less likely that when an individual uh goes extinct within a, an area or an individual species goes extinct within an area that doesn't mean those functional traits become extinct within the area and so we actually found that that was decreasing in the open controls in comparison to the mpa okay next slide and then so looking at a bit more of um looking at specific traits so here we're just looking at three specific ones that we looked at in regard to mobile demersal fishing, which is what was prohibited in the first place in the MPA. Um, we've got filter feeding, then sessile um, organisms, then crawler organisms. And we actually found that, as could probably be expected, the, the filter feeding organisms in the MPA in relation to the open control were significantly increasing over time. And same for the sessile species. Um, whereas the crawler species, so more mobile species, were becoming more uh, common in the open controls in comparison with the MPA. This is quite an interesting find because um, the MPA itself was uh, protected for, um, for different reef associated species and the habitats um, around the rocky reef areas. And we can see that these are the species that are associated with this, these areas are increasing over time with their traits increasing specifically. Uh, next slide. So what have we found? We've, so looking at actually monitoring projects and how we can use these in, information um, for other projects, I think it's really important to have good uh, consistency over time with sampling regimes to see what's happening every single year, because each year, as we've found is, is different, but you can see, you can start to pick out trends over long periods of time using different metrics, such as functional metrics or uh, taxonomic metrics are really useful to, for pinpointing different processes happening within the ecosystem and they're actually using different methods. So here the baited and the toad video uh, together gives us a bigger picture of the ecosystem that we're service, uh, surveying. And that when we're surveying, um, sensitive or fragile ecosystems that are nationally and internationally important because of their biodiversity, we need to use non-destructive and non-extractive methods to sample these areas. And as you can see from the, the top images um, in this little graph, uh, you need to be flexible with, with your methods. So you need to have um, redundancy allowable for when basically things don't go right. You've got two poor vis or a, a starfish goes crawling in front of your camera. So more looking at the, the whole site approach here, it's using the principles of ecosystem-based fisheries management um, 
And this has led to increases in the sessile species, as Emma found early on. But also these um, increases in the sessile species can be seen um, going from bottom up, up the trophic web into the more mobile and exploited fishery species that we found. So next slide, please. That was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I'd love to say thank you to everyone that's both funded the EU, DEFRA, Natural England Blue and the University of Plymouth, but the fishers involved, um, allowing us to survey every single year and all of the team, the staff, the volunteers and um, researchers that have been involved in the project over the, the, the 12 years of it and um, made this such an amazing data set to work with. Um, yeah, next slide. Lovely. Thank you very much, Bede. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Okay, lovely. Okay, um, so we've got a couple of questions from the audience. And first of all, just for those people who are not familiar um, with this kind of uh, analysis, uh, can you just explain what a functional trait is? Uh, yeah, so, so using... Uh, different biological traits to do with an organism's life history can kind of imply um, some information to do with the, the ecosystem service or ecosystem processes that might be going on with these species. So for example, um, we look specifically at uh, motility, so how organisms are getting around, whether they're sessile, whether they're crawling, whether they're swimming, um, and then also looking at um, uh, feeding types, so whether they are scavengers, predators, whether they're uh, photosynthesize uh, the different the different methods that they they create food um, yeah there's there's a big big data set of the different ones that we used and um, actually used the marlin biotic data set uh, for a lot of the information that we used and um, also uh, sea life base and fish base as well okay. um, from John Luke he made the observation that the rare taxa are rarer in the MPA and um, wants to know your opinion on whether you think that trawling, whether trawling results in an, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Um, is there a dominance of species in a more undisturbed habitat, which leads to a more um, biomass and less biodiversity? And how you might think this might change over even longer time, time scales? Yeah, so I, I think I agree that I think um, with. Yeah, with, with the disturbance, it's going to lead to certain species becoming very, very dominant. Um, but also that, yeah, um, as a ecosystem becomes less disturbed, it will it will lead to sort of the more of that classic triangular pyramid of um, uh, abundances of species and that higher trophic species are potentially rarer, but have higher biomass um, and therefore, yeah, less diversity is you've got the sort of extended um, abundance of the lower trophic species. Okay, lovely. Um, we've got probably about 30 seconds left. Um, so I'm sorry that I can see some great questions coming in, but um, hopefully B can get, get back to you directly. Um, but just one from Morgan that's just come in is, can you expand on the mobile fish data? And when you say they increase twice as fast inside the MPA, what does that mean? Uh, so just using the, the linear models that we use to um, look at the rate of change over time in the, for example, that was that was to do with the number of exploited fish taxa. Um, the the angle of the, the line from the linear model was had a, a slope twice as fast or twice as large. So the, the angle of the line for the exploited fish was, I think, 0 0.14. So every single year we were seeing an increase of 0.14 in the number of taxa that we were seeing, whereas for the MPA it was 0 0.062, so, so um, less than half at the rate of change. All right, lovely. Well, obviously, B, you've got such a short amount of time to talk about a lot of research that you've been doing over three years. So um, thank you for, for that um, brief overview. And to Morgan and everyone else, be publishing frantically now and so all of this information will be available um for to access so um thank you bead and i think we need to move on to our next speaker now um so this is emily whiting from natural england 
and she'll be presenting using seabed imagery to inform management. Over to you, Emily. Hiya, so good morning everyone. Um, I'm Emily. I currently work as an environment advisor in the Somerset team at Natural England. However, today I'm going to be presenting the findings of my master's thesis that I completed last year um, with Emma as my supervisor at the University of Plymouth. So um, this work was carried out in partnership with Devon and Seven Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority and looks into utilising seabed imagery analysis to inform management. Um, particularly in two marine conservation zones in North Devon. So next slide, please. Um, so following the introduction of the Marine and Coastal Access Act, the UK government started creating a network of MCZs, including um, the North Devon Tranche 2 um, Marine Conservation Zones. So Biddeford to Fallen Point here in red um, and Heartland Point to Tintagel here in yellow. Protected areas um, like these are known to enhance conservation measures. Um, however, it's also recognised that they alone cannot ensure the persistence of habitats in their communities. Um, so I wanted to look into how we can um, manage the wider marine environment. Um, around the UK, uh, benthic habitats are known to have a high ecological value, providing important structural complexity and supporting diverse communities. However, these ecosystems in particular are under threat from um, fishing activities. So it's really important to start understanding um, um, and providing effective management to consider um, the ecology from the impacts of fishing. In England, the IFCAs um, look after fisheries management and currently within Biddeford Fallen Point, there is the prohibition of the removal of European spiny lobster. Um, in Heartland Point to Tintagel, um, Cornwall and Devon and Savinifka um, districts overlap as well as extending into MMO jurisdiction. However, neither IFCA nor the MMO have direct management measures currently in place. Um, it's known that toad demersal gear is utilised within both MCZs and therefore it's vital to um, look at the potential impact that these activities can be having on the benthic ecosystems. Um, to aid management decisions, um, it's firstly vital to understand the location and extent of habitats and features of the conservation interest, as different biotopes may necessitate different management. Um, therefore, I started using seabed imagery as a tool to provide current information of the habitats and features within the sites, um, allowing for mapping of unit habitats um, and for the sensitivity to fishing activities to be determined. In addition, I also um, looked at the features of conservation interest, focusing on those highlighted in the conservation objectives. So in Bidford to Fallen Point, this was um, including fragile sponge and zone communities, pink sea fans, um, Savalaria Reef, and the European spiny lobster. Um, and similarly in Heartland Point, Tintagel, this looked at fragile sponge and zone communities, pink sea fans, and Savalaria Reef. Uh, next slide, please. So these surveys were carried out by the Inshore Marine Protected Areas Group, which includes members from um, a range of statutory nature conservation bodies, such as Natural England, the Environment Agency, CFAS, the MMO and the IFCAS. Um, in terms of the survey design, drop cameras were deployed at stations throughout the sites, capturing still images of the seabed um, every 10 to 15 metres over 150 metres of transect. I then went away and analysed these stills using Beagle online software. Um, determining and identifying the species to the highest taxonomic level um, could be confidently achieved. And then UNIS biotopes were assigned to each image depending on the communities present and the dominant substrate type. Um, the sensitivity of the biotopes to fishing was then assessed utilising the Marine Evidence Based Sensitivity Assessment Database, um, which allowed sensitivity scores to be assigned as a combination of resistance and resilience to different pressures um, associated with fishing activities. For example, I looked at um, abrasion, penetration, and the removal of non-target and target species. Um, next slide, please. So when looking at what I found at Biddeford to Fallen Point, there were 12 different biotopes, uh, UNIS biotopes observed across the site. Um, the most frequently encountered being circulatory fine sand, 
followed by echinoderms and crestose communities on circulatory rocks. When assigning um, sensitivities, it was found that all stations showed a medium to high sensitivity to fishing. Um, high scores are seen to be associated with rockier habitats, as these are less dynamic, supporting slower growing species, which are unable to recover from physical damage as easily. Where sedimentary habitats were encountered, um, they were found to have more medium sensitivity, um, as they were still vulnerable to the alteration of ecological structure from the removal of species. Next slide, please. So in terms of the features of conservation interest, um, no pink um, sea fans, European spiny lobster or Sabalera reef um, were observed within the site. However, this doesn't mean that um, features were not present within the site and efforts should still continue to observe further their conservation objectives. However, 31% um, of the stills indicated the presence of fragile sponge nut zone communities. Um, so when looking into the distribution of these communities, um, they are found more likely to occur on rocky or mosaic habitats. Previous studies have highlighted the importance of rocky reef biodiversity. However, here um, our results were also presenting an argument for the importance of sediment veneers which, um, and mosaic habitats that are essential for the success of marine ecosystems. Um, allowing for different life stages, foraging techniques to be accommodated, um, maintaining biodiversity for the wider ecosystem. It's therefore really vital that the extent of conservation measures begins to reflect the distribution of communities beyond those um, rocky reef boundaries. Uh, next slide, please. So when looking at Hartland Point to Tintagel, 10 Eunice biotopes were observed. Um, the most frequently seen was echinoderms and crestose communities on circulatory rock again. Um, and it was found that almost 60% of stations within this site had a high sensitivity to fishing, again, suggesting that the MCZ um, is currently not very resilient or resistant to fishing. The biotopes are found to be really highly sensitive to the removal of species and abrasion at the surface of the substrata, implying that it's sensitive um, to the alteration of ecological structure and is not um, negatively impacted by um, abrasive fishing gears. Um, this provides further evidence that fishing gears should be minimised within the MCZ um, to ensure conservation of sensitive biotopes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so pink sea fans were observed to associate themselves um, more with rockier habitats, coinciding with the current understanding of um, their associations with UK reef. Fragile sponge and that zone communities were observed at all stations throughout a range of broad scale habitats, um, reiterating the importance of habitat veneers for these communities. Um, however, there wasn't any significant um, difference in the habitat associations of Savalera Reef, implying that other factors may be driving the distribution of these um, ecologically important habitats. Next slide, please. So this study was able to utilize um, seabed imagery to provide current information on the location and habitats um, within Devon's marine conservation zones, finding um, that a diverse range of biotopes are present in both of the MCZs, all of which were seen to be really sensitive to um, associated fishing activities. The distributions of different features um, indicated the importance of habitat mosaics, suggesting that the features of functional reef may extend beyond substrate extent and highlighting the importance um, for biotope vulnerability to also extend beyond this point. So when applying this information to management, um, it can be suggested that a shift from the current feature-based management may be um, to one that considers a whole site approach may be necessary. Um, as the current feature-based management may not offer adequate protection, overlooking those significant habitat mosaics and veneers um, and um, allowing an ecosystem to recover its natural dynamics, allowing for shifting baselines in the future. Um, previous studies have also shown that reducing fishing gear, fishing um, can increase biodiversity and habitat complexity. Um, it's vital that management strives to mitigate the impacts of these activities um, 
And further research should look into discovering if there's a sustainable level of fishing that can occur without jeopardizing any ecology. Um, and finally, looking into a comprehensive monitoring program to continue examining the condition um, and ensure that progress is being made to achieving conservation objectives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your time and ask any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Emily. That's brilliant. Um, OK, we've got some questions coming in for you now. Um, the first question was um, whether you could um, explain how these MPA boundaries are actually established in the first place. So in the first place, they undergo a um, range of surveys to determine where um, features and habitats are lying but it's done on a more broad scale. Um, so this was kind of um, ground truthing that data and just kind of um, double checking where different features are and uh, the habitats that are present. Okay, and um, we have a question about Beagle. Um, did you use a standardized image analysis program such as Beagle and are your methods replicable and comparable to future common standards monitoring of the MCZ? Yeah, so I used um, Beagle and I worked with um, a couple of people at CFAS um, to make sure that I was sticking to the approach that they use so that it can be replicated and that the results will standardised and could be comparable um, in the future. There's lots of um, standard approaches when looking at um, um, seabed imagery because you want it to be comparable and use those standardized approaches. So making sure that I was sticking to those is really important when um, I was going through this uh, study. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we've got a question about Sabellaria and um, mm -hmm. could you confer whether it's Sabellaria spinulosa or aviolata um, as these points seem a long way offshore to be um, Sabellaria aviolata? Yeah, I think um, it was Sabellaria avalata. I struggle saying that sometimes, yeah, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's why we didn't see too many of them because our sites were about 10 metres deep. So we didn't really see too many of them throughout the surveys. The ones that we did see were slightly closer inshore, but um, those were under the um, conservation objectives that the sites were looking at conserving. So it was worth keeping an eye out for them if we did see any. Okay. Um, Keith has a question about um, MNCR and sea search surveys, um, pointing out that it have provided a great deal of information on species habitats and biotopes that are present along the North Devon coast. How were the results of those surveys, um, including images used in the study you described? Um, I didn't directly work with sea search surveys, but I do know that they have a huge variety of information on these sites and it would be something to really consider adding into um, the database because they are really um, good sources of information from a wide variety of different disciplines. So um, it's definitely worth considering um, and taking into account when um, providing management advice in the future. Yeah, I think we, I can also add that at the same time as Emily was doing this study with the ISCA, uh, another student, Nikki Harris, was working with um, C-Search and with the C-Search data to do a, a similar kind of project over the scale in the southwest. So um, mm. just to show you, because these data are being used. Yeah, you can really, um, it was really interesting talking to Nikki and seeing the comparisons of um, what we are finding with between the C-Search data and the data from the statutory nature conservation bodies. Great, okay, well, time is against us, I'm afraid. So thank you, Emily, very much for your presentation. And um, it is time to move on to our third speaker. Um, this is Adam Rees from the University of Plymouth, and he will be presenting the Lime Bay Potting Study, defining a threshold for sustainable pot fishing. Over to you, Adam. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> good, good, good. Right. Uh, good morning. Yeah, my name is uh, Adam Rees and I'm a marine ecology uh, postdoc 
I'm currently based in my living room, but in normal times I work at the University of Plymouth and uh, in the Marine Conservation Research Group. And I also work very closely with the Blue Marine Foundation. Um, my talk today is about the Lime Bay Potting Study that some of you might be aware of, um, as I presented some of it um, during the project as part of uh, Southwest Marine Ecosystems before. Um, so it's been going on for a few years, the results of which have just been published. Um, the co-authors co on this work were Emma uh, Sheehan and Martin Atchell, and the project was supported by DEFRA, Blue Marine Foundation and SWEEP. I'll briefly talk about the project's uh, rationale, its developments, the key findings and the uh, implications of the results. Okay, if we could move on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, to repeat some of the information that, um, that Bede gave you, the Lime Bay Marine Protected Area is located in Southwest England and was introduced in 2008 to protect and recover coral gardens that were being degraded by mobile fishing. The area was closed to all bottom toad fishing uh, in 2008. The, um, since then, the MPA has remained open to many other types of commercial and recreational fishing. This is the current state of affairs for, for many marine protected areas around the UK inshore. We refer to these types of MPAs in this study, um, these MPAs that allow some form of fishing to continue um, as being partially protected. Uh, the current study was conceived after concerns were raised by local fishers of the Lime Bay MPA, voicing their concerns over the increasing levels of potting they were seeing uh, after the area was closed and the potential consequences this might be having. Here, potting refers to um, crab and lobster uh, using parlor pots, the kind you often see uh, stacked on key sides around the southwest. Um, and you can see an example of uh, some parlor pots on the right hand side in that photo. Uh, it is a uh, potting and potting the parlor pots is a key method of fishing around the UK and potters typically target high value species such as brown crab and European lobster. Uh, it's a fishing method that may unwittingly be compromising conserva conservation objectives in certain areas um, as there's not a lot of empirical evidence currently available that looks into the impacts of this type of fishing on the ecosystem. The study therefore uh, aims to assess the impacts of potting on the ecosystem and on the local target fishery. Um, if we could move to the next slide, slide please. Uh, okay, so the, the map might be a little bit small in the, in the bottom right hand corner, but we, we designed a four year experimental study to assess the impacts of potting. We introduced a gradient of potting density within experimental areas on similar areas of reef inside the Lime Bay MPA. Uh, you can just about make these out in the map on the right hand side. You can see that the, the red line is the MPA, as you saw earlier in Bede's talk. Um, and then inside the blue squares are um, treatment areas that are, are distributed throughout the MPA. Uh, we manipulated the densities of pots in experimental areas to create this gradient. So we had areas of low potting, medium potting and high potting densities, plus no potting areas which were used as controls. Uh, where potting was removed altogether. These densities of pots were maintained by the local fishermen for four years and the areas were fished in a normal regime. So when fishers went to, uh, went to sea they, and they fished normally, they would also go and fish these experimental pots to ensure that the exposure in these areas, uh, the exposure to fishing uh, was regular and representative of normal fishing. High density areas had the uh, maximum density of pots we could physically fit into one area. And this represented a level of fishing effort above current levels inside of the MPA. Uh, current levels of potting um, in the Lime Bay MPA were characterized by the medium to low densities and replicated the yeah, potting effort in some, lo in some locations in the uh, MPA that it's currently exposed to. Um, and then we had the no potting areas as well. These, uh, these treatment areas were routinely monitored using a range of approaches throughout the project. We used toad underwater video transects to film the seabed and to count the presence and abundance of reef epibiota. To, um, to look at the reef associated mobile community, i.e. the benthic fish and other mobile animals, we used baited remote uh, underwater video, also known as bruvs. And these are the same techniques that B just um, described earlier uh, and you saw the pictures of. So, using similar techniques. This, uh, these surveys were undertaken each year during summer. 
this uh, data was complemented. Uh, uh, this data was complemented using using fishery surveys, which are also carried out with the local fishermen to count the catches of crab and lobster inside of each treatment. As part of these surveys, biometric data such as the carapace size, sex, and weight of individuals, plus the abundance of bicaught species, were also recorded. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is a very quick overview of the key findings uh, after four years. All of the graphs you're going to see uh, on the right hand side will show data from the last year of the study. And um, the potting density treatment is on the uh, x axis, increasing from left to right. And on the y axis, you will see the response variable we tested, such as abundance or taxon richness. Um, on the right hand side here, you will see the results from the toad and baited video surveys where we divided the species we saw up into functional groups. These groups are either reef building species, which are those individual or colonial species that form large structures on rock, uh, or reef associated species, species that live uh, and feed on or near the reef. The reef associated species were then divided further based on their motility into sessile and mobile groups. And you can see the labels on top of the, the corresponding columns of graphs on the right hand side. So the key one I want to draw your attention to is where you can see the red asterisk. Um, after four years, we, we just observed a decline in the number of reef building species, but not in the taxon richness of this group. Uh, following a significant interaction um, from further testing, we, we observed that the numbers of reef building species in the no, low and medium density treatments were significantly greater when compared with, with, the, with the high treatment. Uh, no other significant differences were observed for any of the reef associated groups in either abundance or taxon richness. And if we could click through, there should be another figure. Great. And then, so these are, um, we also looked at indicator species within each functional group um, that, uh, that had a range of life histories. Um, testing of the indicator showed that two of the sensitive reef building species, the Ross coral, a bryozoan, and the Neptune's heart uh, sea squirts had higher abundance where potting was lower. You can see the, these results in the top left and right hand um, sides of the, of the panel on the right. And you can see the pictures of the animals at, uh, above them. Again, the red asterisks um, denote significance. For the Ross coral on the top left, um, we saw greater abundances of potting where pot greater abundances where potting was removed altogether. Of the other indicator, indicator species tested, um, we, there was some patterns in response to increasing density, but none of these were significant and some species so, showed no responses at all. You can see also the, for the Neptune's heart sea squirt, we saw higher abundances in the uh, controlled and low areas compared to the medium and high density treatments. Okay, next slide, please. Again, the graphs on the right show the potting density treatments, uh, but this time for only for the variable of brown crab, uh, for the variable abundance of brown crab and lobster and the sizes of brown crab only. Catch per unit effort for the brown crab and lobster was significantly lower in the high potting treatments. You can see the top two graphs on the right, graphs A and B. For the brown crab, we also saw that mean weight of individuals was lower in the medium and high treatments. You can see this in graph C. Uh, the individuals, that were caught were around 35 um, grams lighter per individual. These lower weights were not related to a skew in the individuals we caught, as mean carapace, remain, carapace size remained consistent and similar across treatments. We think this difference in weight could be related to heavier, higher quality crabs being selected for and removed by fishers, and the lighter, less valuable fish uh, individuals being returned back to the areas, which could be altering the local population within the high treatment areas. These results suggest lower catches and poorer quality of crab in higher potted areas. Can we move to the last slide? Thank you. Uh, so the implications of some of these key uh, findings um, provide some of the first evidence of the longer term effects of potting on sensitive recovering reef habitats and show for the first time that a threshold of potting density might exist. Above this threshold, negative effects on the ecosystem and the fishery can be expected. But if managed correctly at lower levels than potting could be sustainable. We suggest the low effort, high reward strategy likely works for commercial potters 
And we feel this evidence is important as understanding the potential impacts of all fishing methods is important when achieving or trying to achieve well-managed fisheries inside partially protected MPAs, especially when considering such high value fisheries um, like the potting target. Um, it's a method of fishing that targets non quota species um, supports many small scale fishers around the, around the UK coastline and is an important method of fishing uh, that does not currently have many limits in place to cap commercial effort. So I'd like to conclude there and you can see a link at the bottom to a recently published paper and I'd like to take any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Adam. That's, that's excellent. Um, we have got lots of questions for you. Um, so first of all, who controls um, who and how many pots are allowed in the area? And how did you keep migrating potters out of the area? Yeah, so uh, the fishers controlled the, um, the pot densities in the areas, but that was after a long consult consultation with the Lime Bay Consultative Committee, which is a small management group of local fishers in the area. When we were deciding on the densities, we had our, our control areas, which were 500 by 500 metres. Um, we wanted to replicate elevated levels of potting. So we asked how many pots could we physically put in that area? Um, and then that was our high density. And then we decided on, on some medium and low densities um, working back from there. And then we had areas where we removed potting altogether. And they were decided on by local, um, we're using local fishers uh, expertise. And then to stop migrating fishers, we just spent a long time engaging with the fishermen um, and the fishing communities of Lime Bay. We have, we've built up quite a good relationship over the years and through the Blue Marine Foundation, they have their consultative committee, um, which uh, brings together heads of the, of the key ports inside the fishing area, uh, inside the MPA. And they are, um, we, we talked about the project to them. Um, we decided on how this project was going to go about and, and basically got them all on side, all of the guys that fish in the area. And I guess some level of self-policing was important in terms of if a fisher notices other people coming into the MPA, then it would be up to us to try and um, tell them about the project and try and um, keep them out. We had loads of um, uh, emails and flyers going out to local fishing ports to let them know that this project was going on. And we didn't actually find too many incursions throughout the duration of the project, which was great. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, where else do you think this method of determining a sustainable potting effort uh, could be used nationally or internationally? Um, in terms of the actual project itself, I mean, um, the, the setup of it can be can be done on any areas where there might be concerns over sensitive reef habitats being exposed to um, pots on the ground. Obviously, it's a big fishery throughout the whole of the inshore coast around most of the UK. And there are varying um, habitats that have sensitive species present. And so something similar could be replicated in terms of the actual um, results and the densities of, of, of what we found um, in this uh, project did be applied to very similar based habitats. And I know that the uh, ecosystems differ quite, um, quite widely around the UK coast. So uh, applying the results would need some interpretation and understanding of, of what sensitive species exist in, current, in, in areas of interest. Okay, great. Um, we've got loads of questions, so you can have a look at these. Um, um. <laughs> But um, so we've got one minute and um, I feel like drawing this out of a hat. Um, do you think that the areas, the manipulated areas, were large enough treatment areas to give a reliable result for crab yield? And if you were going to conduct the study again, what would you change? OK. Um, 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, the areas, um, we were, I think we weren't really expecting to see maybe a difference in the, in the crab and lobster local population as it is such a transient population throughout the, the whole MPA. I think that we're seeing a, a, an effect on local, um, like pop, localized populations and, and we have, um, we're careful about what that means for the wider population. Um, so, and if I was going to do it again, um, <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I, we, we'd love to, um, capture more information on um, some of the, uh, we caught information on the bycatch of species, but I'd love to know um, a little bit more about the, the fishery side of things. Uh, that's cool. 
<laughs> no, that's great. Right, we we really are out of time. So, um, Adam, you can get back to people directly um, okay. through the chat and the Q and A. But um, thank you very much. So, let's move on to our final speaker in this first part of the session this morning. Um, so, right, where am I? So now we have Love Day Trinic, and she'll be presenting the work of the Remedies Project in behaviour change and restoration to improve the condition of five special areas of conservation. So over to you, uh, Love Day, thank you. Brilliant, thanks Emma. Um, exactly that, I'm going to be talking uh, about the Life Recreation Remedies Project. Um, it's work in habitat restoration and behaviour change to improve the condition of five special areas of conservation on the south coast uh, of the UK, uh, of England. So um, next slide please. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, so special areas of conservation, I've got a, 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 I'm imagining most people in the audience here uh, have a pretty good understanding of, of uh, these uh, designated sites, but just, just in case of any, anyone who isn't. Uh, special areas of conservation are protected uh, in the UK under the EU Habitat Directive. Um, they uh, protect habitats and species, and uh, we are focusing on five of these areas. Um, the reason we're focusing on, on the five that we are, if we click onto the next screen, we should be able to uh, go on to a little bit about the project uh, and a map there of the, of the five that we are we are working in. So as you can see in the map there, we're looking at the Isles of Scilly, uh, looking at the Fallon Helford, Plymouth Sound and Estuaries, uh, Solon Maritime and Essex, Essex Estuaries. Um, so these five special areas of uh, conservation uh, have been shown to have seabed habitats in unfavourable condition. Uh, and the aim of the EU Life Remedies project is to uh, start moving the, the, that condition towards favourable, so uh, put measures in place to, to improve the condition of seabed habitats uh, within these, these five sites. Um, so it's a four-year project, uh, EU funded by LIFE, uh, and it has a number of different remits, a number of different areas uh, run by different partners. Uh, so uh, I work for the Ocean Conservation Trust, and uh, we're doing a couple, a couple of areas I'll come on to in a moment, but we also have Marine Conservation Society, uh, who are doing a lot of work uh, with uh, education, but also with the advanced mooring systems, which I'll come on to later, uh, and, and other things like that. We also have the Royal Yachting Association, uh, and we have Plymouth uh, City Council and Tamar Estuaries uh, Consultative Fund. So we've got all sorts of uh, people involved in this project, all sorts of partners, uh, and it's run by Natural England. Uh, so all sorts of people involved in, in making this project uh, as good as it is. Uh, we are focusing on uh, a number of Annex 1 uh, marine habitats. Uh, as you can see on the slide there, we've got uh, the really catchy titles of those Annex 1 uh, habitats. Uh, sandbanks slightly covered in water all the time. Uh, I'll leave you to read those, but uh, those are the habitats that we are, we are looking at. Uh, and I'd like to, on our next slide, please, uh, zoom in onto uh, one of the special areas of conservation. Um, which is Plymouth Sound. As you can see, there's a map of, of the site uh, and just dotted on there are a, a few of the seagrass beds. Uh, so seagrass is uh, one of the habitats uh, we are very closely working with uh, within Remedies, along with mill beds. Um, but uh, seagrass beds is, is really what, what I'm going to focus on uh, for the rest of, of this, um, this presentation. Uh, so you can see on the slide there, there's a number of seagrass beds uh, dotted uh, throughout Plymouth Sound. And uh, we are on the next slide going to hopefully uh, have a video. Hope that will play. Now, as I'm sure we're all aware, marine habitats are fantastic, they're beautiful, they're diverse and, and fundamentally important to all of our survival, but uh, quite often people don't get to see them. So uh, I always like to include a video just so everyone can have a, a little sneaky peek. Uh, so seagrass uh, is a habitat that grows in uh, shallow uh, bays, uh, usually within about 10 metres of, of water. It needs good water quality, good clarity uh, to, to get enough light down there. Uh, and it is an incredible habitat for uh, not just these, cra these crabs here, but those two piggybacking crabs, uh, but commercial fish species. So it's a, it's a nursery ground for many important commercial fish species. It's also a, a, a ground where you get uh, the two species of UK seahorse. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a nice sheltered habitat for delicate species like that, um, rare and protected species. Um, it also provides us with many other ecosystem services. So 
Um, it binds the sediment to protect, uh, protect seabed sediments uh, and does that with its roots, uh, its rooting structure. Uh, unlike our seaweeds, uh, the seagrass is a plant, it's a flowering plant, so uh, quite unique in the marine world. Uh, and it does bind that sediment to prevent it from, from washing away. Um, it also protects our coastal communities from wave damage and tidal surge just by taking the energy out of those waves and I think probably most importantly it's actually a, a, an incredibly efficient carbon sink as well it's a, it's a blue carbon uh, environment so it's it's really important in in our fight against climate change as well uh, so amazing habitat we've seen that video go through a few times uh, it's it's a great video we can click on to the next slide though uh, and see uh, a little bit more about uh, the ecosystem threat. So we heard a little bit there about the ecosystem services, um, but as we all know, it's a two-way street. Uh, we get stuff from the ocean, but we also have an impact on it. So uh, there are a number of impacts on seagrass beds at the moment, including climate change, uh, which can in increase the the uh, likelihood of uh, extreme weather events which can can affect the uh, seagrass beds um, it can also uh, affect the uh, the sea, sea uh, level rise so we get less light down to our seagrass beds we also have uh, runoff from the land so agricultural runoff uh, from the land can cause eutrophication uh, which which isn't isn't good for seagrass and we also have uh, fishing damage as well which our other speakers have, have spoken spoken about uh, a great deal today. So, um, with the with the, with all of those impacts, uh, it's hard to pick just one for a project to focus on. But life recreation remedies is um, focusing on uh, the damage uh, that can be caused uh, by the recreational boaters. Uh, so we are going to be looking at that in a little bit more detail now. If we click on to the next slide. Lovely. Uh, so part of the work of uh, the Life Recreation Remedies project is to work with uh, recreational boaters, um, harbour authorities and stakeholders uh, to trial and uh, plan and fund uh, advanced mooring systems. Uh, now, the reason we're looking at these advanced mooring systems or eco moorings, uh, they sometimes get called as well, uh, is, uh, is because of the images on the screen here. We've got lots of beautiful popular bays uh, around our south coast, uh, lots of wonderful places that people like to go and hang out on their boats. If I had one, I'd do it too. Um, but unfortunately, the damage uh, from two activities of recreational boaters, uh, I, uh, mainly mooring uh, and anchoring, uh, can cause damage to, to seabed habitats. Uh, and you can see in the pictures there, we've got um, a scar from an anchor on the left hand side there where an anchor has been dragged through uh, some habitat and removed uh, some of the vegetation. Uh, and we also have a traditional traditional mooring on the right there where the, the chain has caused a scour on the seabed preventing the seagrass from growing. Now, unfortunately, once this, once this damage occurs, uh, it can be quite hard to reverse. So we do, we do need to, to look at this as an impact. Uh, and it's one that we can actually all do something about uh, because on the next slide, you can see uh, that by installing uh, advanced mooring systems, uh, you can lift that chain off the seabed uh, and provide the seabed with some protection uh, from that damaging scouring effect. Now, the image you can see here is of the Sterling advanced mooring system, uh, and it's a very simple design. Uh, it's just got floated buoys which lift the chain off of the seabed, uh, preventing it from having that scouring effect. There are other options, making the, the, um, the road out of a different material, elasticated material, uh, uh, which which uh, prevents that scouring as well. So there's a number of different models and the idea of the this part of the project is to, as I say, fund trial and work with stakeholders, hub authorities and boaters uh, to find, find the ones that work best uh, in our changeable and wonderful environments that we have around our south coast. Um, so that's that's part of the project and that's really the behaviour change aspect of the project because it is working with boaters uh, to try and make sure that they have faith in these systems and are willing to use them uh, with their with their boats uh, and also change their anchoring behaviours to make sure that they're not having that impact on the seabed that we saw uh, in that image earlier. Now we are, this is the protection aspect of our project. This is this is what we're doing to try and try and change that uh, impact directly. Uh, Unfortunately, there has been a lot of seagrass lost already, something like the 92% the of the, the seabed um, seagrass uh, habitat in the UK has been lost uh, already. So we do need to actually do something to put it back. Uh, and on our next slide, 
I'm just going to talk very briefly uh, about uh, restoration. Uh, so we're going to protect what's still there, we're going to protect what we're growing, but uh, we are going to put some back in there. So part of the project that the Ocean Conservation Trust is heading up is the seagrass restoration. Uh, and you can see just a brief overview, I'm going to talk quite quickly as I think I'm running out of time, um, about uh, what, what, we, what we do here. So we do go out into healthy seagrass beds. Um, ones chosen by Natural England that are in, in, in good condition uh, and we collect seeds and we do that with, with scuba diving so we go and collect uh, seeds from healthy beds and we bring them back to the National Marine Aquarium which is, is home of the Ocean Conservation Trust uh, where we have a purpose-built lab uh, and we prepare those seeds uh, for planting uh, you can see in the middle there, there's a handful of seeds, they're very tiny. Uh, we then plant them in uh, purpose-made uh, little Hessian planting units. Um, a proportion of those are then actually grown on in that lab. So we, we care for those seeds, we give them uh, really good, you know, uh, conditions for growth, good conditions for growth. We grow the seedlings uh, and those are then to be transplanted back into the ocean. Uh, a greater proportion of those bags are deposited straight into the into the seabed uh, without growing on on in the lab. So a number of different ways of planting. Uh, the goal of this is to restore eight hectares of, of uh, seagrass bed in the Plymouth Sound and Solent Maritime. Uh, so two of our special areas of, of conservation. Uh, and I think if we click onto the next slide, I think it's the next one, we might have got a map to show you. Wonderful. Uh, so we had some uh, environmental modelling uh, done by uh, Exeter University uh, and they have uh, highlighted these areas in yellow as, as sites that are suitable for restoration uh, and the blocks that are slightly darker green with a, with a brighter yellow around them, those are the sites that we've chosen. So just off of Jenny Cliff there, um, those are our sites uh, for our restoration. Uh, we will be uh, also placing a voluntary no anchor zone around there to, to help protect the work we're doing um, and hopefully uh, it means that we'll have another flourishing wonderful seagrass bed uh, in place in Plymouth Sound. Fantastic, if we click on to the next slide I think we have come to the end of my presentation so thank you so much for listening uh, and I'm very happy to take any questions. That's brilliant, thank you very much. What an amazing project. Um, one, one of the questions was, have you got any uh, scope within the project to extend the sites further into other MCZs across the southwest? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, not within the scope of this project. Uh, this is uh, very much uh, trialling methods um, for AMS and for restoration. Uh, there are a number of other restoration projects uh, ongoing at the moment. Um, um, we're all finding out the best way of doing it. So um, ongoing projects, uh, potentially, uh, you know, we're all just laying the groundwork for hopefully this becoming uh, an easier thing to do and something that, that more projects take on and, and carry out in more, more sites. Yeah. And uh, now can you comment on, um, you know, the eco moorings are great, but how do we change the behaviour of boat users who are not local and might not care? Uh, a really good question. Behaviour change is such a massive area of social science uh, with so much work going into it. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do and it's a very difficult thing to say that you've achieved and actually managed to, to it, you can't ever say I think that you've fully achieved behaviour change uh, unless you've got a very long long term study on it so um, what we're doing is working with boaters to try and increase their confidence uh, in local boaters but you're quite right boaters that come into the area on, on their summer holidays um, I think a lack of care might, might, I'm sure some boaters don't care, but um, if you speak to boaters about it, actually most of the time they, they really do care. Uh, and if they know that the seagrass is there or that there's another sensitive habitat, mile beds or and anything really they, they do want to help they do want to uh, protect what's there and quite often the barrier to them doing that is is knowledge and awareness of, of the habitats that are, are in place and if you give them an alternative if you tell them to you know just over there that there's no seagrass anchor there they will do it uh, there's also good anchoring practice so we're working with the Royal Yachting Association within this project as well who are delivering amazing training to boaters on on how to anchor uh, the, in a way that minimises their damage on, on seabed habitats because another thing we, we do get is that safety is a pri priority so if you've got to anchor you've got to anchor and we wouldn't want that to be any other way so finding a way of anchoring safely without damaging seabed habitats is, is another way uh, but increasing confidence in these moorings is, is key 
uh, and then I think the rest rest follows once you see voters doing it other voters will do it so yeah 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 okay wonderful well we are now out of time um so th there are loads of questions for you as well all things to do with carbon sequestration and bungee moorings <laughs> um, so I'll let you um, have a look at those um now um but yeah we must take a break um, to allow our panellists to switch over. So um, thank you so much to all our speakers today. It's been really fantastic. And I really appreciate all the time that you made preparing your presentations and for keeping to time as well. Um, so please, everybody, if you just hang on here, we will be back in 10 minutes um, to start at 11.15. So grab a quick cuppa and then um, the management presentations will start at 11.15. So I'll see you back here soon. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, what are we? Still morning. Good morning, still everyone. Um, my name is Sean Rees. I'm based at the University of Plymouth. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to part two of the webinar. Um, we have five speakers lined up to give you updates on aspects of research and applied marine management in the Southwest. Each speaker has about 10 minutes and we have all of our panelists ready. Um, and then we have about three to five minutes for questions afterwards, um, if there is enough time. So to keep this session alive, please uh, do use the question and answers and we'll try and have those conversations and answer questions as we go along. You can also use the chat function as well. Um, but just do be aware that it is quite busy and uh, chat disappears quite quickly, but we will do our best to keep up. Um, Emma gave you all the housekeeping at the beginning of this, so I won't uh, repeat that, but just a reminder to, um, to remain respectful to each other, to uh, keep on topic and to enjoy the presentations. So I will now welcome our first speaker and our first speaker is uh, Thomas Stamp, and Tom is a postdoc at the University of Plymouth, and he will be presenting on some of his PhD research. So go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my name is Tom Stamp. I work for the University of Plymouth, and today I'm just going to be presenting some of the sort of results from our European Bass Tracking Project, uh, which we conducted in collaboration with the Devon and Senate IFCA, and was funded through a European Maritime and Fisheries Fund grant. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So we set the project up uh, in 2018. Uh, there was quite a rapid decline in European bass um, across the North Atlantic, and the Devon and Seven IFCA were just generally interested to look at um, any sort of management measures that they could take at a local level, which might have a positive impact on local bass populations. Um, so we basically wanted to look at how much time the fish spent within um, what are called designated bass nursery areas. And these are just areas that have been identified as being important as nursery areas for bass. Um, and they generally take the form of estuaries and sort of shallow coastal bays around the southwest coast, southwest and east coast of the United Kingdom. Um, we also wanted to look at what sort of habitats were important for these fish and sort of generally describe their movement characteristics within the open coastline. So is a bass that you catch in Devon really from Devon or do they move more broadly? So we used a technique called acoustic telemetry and we basically got a bunch of anglers to go out and catch some bass from us um, across three different, initially from three different bass nursery areas um, in Devon. And um, that was Sulcum Harbour, the Dart Estuary, and the Tor Torridge. Within these fish, we implanted um, a small acoustic transmitter tag, which uh, sits in the body cavity of the fish and emits a unique ping every 90 seconds, which we can detect um, when the fish is within range of around sort of three to 400 meters of um, some of our sort of strategically placed acoustic, acoustic receivers. Um, Initially, these receivers were deployed, um, as I say, within Sulcum Harbour, the Dart and the Tor Torridge Estuary, um, but we've now expanded. Um, so um, we've got receivers now across eight different estuaries along the south coast of Devon, and we've, we've pretty much got every estuary along South Devon covered. Um, we've also got receivers at Lundy Island, um, an offshore mussel farm in Sidmouth, and um, a well-known sort of bass wreck within Lime Bay. We've also tagged um, to date around 208 individual bass um, and um, 
basically the system works um, in, each, in each of our sites, the, the fish are just swimming around and they have these tags going off every 90 seconds and um, our receivers are set up in sort of gates. So we have a line of receivers and whenever the fish pass that receiver line, uh, we get the time and date that each individual fish made that movement. And by connecting the dots, um, not only within sites, but also between sites, we can get a really good picture of how these fish behave and how they use these sort of inshore areas. Um, okay, next slide, please. So um, we've been, the project is still live, so we are collecting information as we go. Um, but um, at the moment, we've got two years, two years of good data from the fish that we tagged in the darts, uh, Sulcum Harbour and the Tor Torridge. And we're also starting to get information from the new fish that we tagged um, within the X and the team last year. So um, over the last two years, we've redetected um, our fish just over 5 million times, which is, which is a huge amount of data to get from one of these sort of surveys. And um, the sort of first result that we really, really were able to get was that um, the fish are very local and they do, um, they are, they're either within the sort of nursery area or they live within sort of three to four kilometers of that site for about 75% of the year. And, um, and we sort of like looked at um, what sort of environmental variables might correlate with um, how these fish are behaving. So we looked at whether it was day or night, um, whether you've got a sort of a spring or a tidal, a spring or a neat tidal cycle, or local water temperature. And um, all of these variables did correlate with whether the fish were present or absent, but what local water temperature was a really, really key variable that we found. And that is most really obviously shown within this plot on the right hand side. Um, so this is called an abacus plot. Um, and basically each line represents um, an individual fish. Um, and um, whenever that fish was present, um, you get a mark on, on, on that plot. Um, each panel represents um, just whether the fish was detected in that particular site. So we've got all the fish from the dark uh, at the top, Solcombe Harbour in the middle and uh, the Tor Torridge on the bottom. Um, and basically what you can see is that in places like Solcombe Harbour, for example, uh, the fish are present throughout the entire year. Um, whereas in the dark estuary, um, we've, got, we've got two years of data here and you can see in both winters, there's these really distinct gaps in the, in the, in the middle of the winter, the coldest time of year. And um, this is really um, quite crucial because we found that we, we put water loggers within with our tracking network and we found that in places like Solcombe Harbour, which isn't um, like a, a typical estuary, you don't have a really big river flowing into it, that has a really big impact on not only water temperature but also salinity. And um, as an example, we found that during the sort of coldest time of the year, the water temperature in Sulcombe Harbour could be up to around three degrees warmer than in surrounding estuaries. And even in the dark, the dark estuary, which is only, um, what's that, like 20 kilometres away, um, there's this really big difference in local water temperature. And we think that has a real fundamental impact on how these fish behave. Okay, next slide, please. So um, while the fish are very local, so they, they, as I mentioned, they do stay very local for about 75% of the year. They also do move really widely. And about 30% of the fish that we've tagged, um, we recorded them sort of leapfrogging between different estuaries. Um, so an example being that we tagged um, a new group of fish in the teen estuary um, in October last year. And very quickly, we start detecting some of these fish moving into the Dart Estuary, and then a few days later into Sulcum Harbour, and then a few days later into Plymouth Sound. Um, and um, we've also had lots of movement between the, uh, the Dart Estuary and Sulcum Harbour, and even had some fish, several fish now, move between South Devon um, up round the, round the Southwest Peninsula into the Tor Torridge in North Devon. And even some fish moving even further. So they've, they've moved round into the Tor Torridge and then they've been picked up by a, a separate research group um, in Swansea Bay um, and Saundersfoot and then on at Strumble Head. And that, that, that track is about 600 kilometers. And while, while they do make these big movements, we've detected loads of these fish still moving back. So um, fish in Sulcombe Harbour, we've, we've monitored them moving around the Southwest Peninsula, which takes them about a month. Um, and then they move back again. So they're really, really faithful to a particular location and then they stay there for, for a very long period of time. And um, we think that this sort of leapfrogging movement between different estuaries might be evidence that they're using some element of the coastline to potentially navigate um, and that they might not be moving as individuals, but also as shoals. And to illustrate that, I've got a picture on um, my ne next slide, please. Um, so this was taken by Keith Hiscock in Firestone Bay in the, in, in the 4th of January. 
this year um, and basically some of our fish we've had four fish uh, detected in Plymouth Sound um, they came in around sort of mid December and they left in mid January and actually we think that in this picture they may be one of our tagged fish um, so thanks for that Keith um, and it really just sort of highlights that um, fish can be these bass can be present within these um, sort of coast near shore coastal environments um, sort of all year especially in the winter um, so can next slide please so just just to bring it back to like why does this matter and why why should we care about how these fish are behaving um so we've shown that although the fish do move quite widely they can exist in these really small discrete uh, little areas of around three to four kilometers for a significant amount of the year and um the way these fish are managed is it assumes that there's one single population across the whole north atlantic which is an area of around six hundred thousand kilometers squared and that huge discrepancy between um, the area that they're managed at and the actual size of these local populations could have quite a big impact. So the local fish populations are going to be very, very dependent on local habitat availability, local prey availability, local weather systems, um, and that just currently isn't recognised within uh, European bass management. Um, also with a lot of these uh, designated protected areas, the designated bass nursery areas, um, a lot of them are only seasonally protected from commercial fishing. Um, and there was this sort of historical assumption that bass weren't present within estuaries during the winter, whereas we've actually found a lot of evidence that certainly in places like Salcombe Harbour and potentially other maybe natural harbours that you get along the south coast of the UK, um, bass may be present all through the year. Um, now, moving forward, um, we've potentially won some further funding to further on this research to expand to a number of other sites and work with another uh, a number of other species across the English Channel. Um, so um, hopefully we'll be able to get more of this information into the future and get more and more information about how these fish move and use different habitats within the coastal environment. OK, next slide, please. Um, so that's it. And if anyone's got any questions, then um, please just um, say so on the um, uh, chat thank you wonderful thank you tom um i think everyone's gone a bit quiet on the chat everyone's going to get their coffees and, and teas um but that was a great presentation thank you um and i guess my question to you is that um bass have been in decline for a very long time and if we were to make a single change and we could do that change um, al almost immediately to the maximum effect uh, what do you think should be the priority to take forward? Um, I think just holistic management policies should be implemented. So um, accounting for the habitats that the fish need, but also limited and also more spatially relevant um, assessments of stock structure, basically. So the one thing that we found is that they are really just, just they do have these really small populations. Um, and it's not just us that have found it. So a number of other researchers have said that bass exist in much smaller populations than are currently assessed. I think potentially that would be one key thing that could be changed, basically. It's just changing the way that they are managed and changing the way that you think about how bass populations exist. Great. Um, and Emma has a question here of what new species are you interested in tracking? Uh, so we're going to be focusing on bass again, um, but also pollock, um, and we're going to be working with Exeter University, who are going to be tracking bluefin tuna, um, and um, also uh, crawfish, spiny lobster, um, in the Isles of Scilly. And what is it that you hope to achieve by, by linking up tagging of all of these different species? So just get a better inf better idea of what habitats are really important for these for these fish. So we know that certain fish breed at certain times of the year on particular places, um, and just trying to really highlight that you need to think about the habitats of these fish as well as managing the sort of commercial pressure on the stocks. And we have some questions in the chat, um, and we've got a couple of mm, couple of minutes to answer some of those. So we have one from. Uh, Oh, crikey. Uh, Jean-Luc here is saying uh, estuarine set netting in, is banned in estuaries. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so in the Devon 7 IFCA, they've got a netting ban uh, within estuaries. Um, Cornwall IFCA, I think, have also got one, but a number of the other IFCAs haven't at the moment got um, bans on netting within estuaries. And um, in particular, in the winter time when bass might be present within these sites. Um, in some places, I don't think that's fully protected, basically. 
And uh, Ian Reid would like to know, when are the results likely to be published or accessible? So at the moment we're um, preparing our first like publication um, and they should be within the next sort of six months, hopefully, fingers crossed, be published within the public domain. <laughs> That's more, it's more of a supervisor's question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think um, I, did, I did see one down here, which is to do with, uh, oh, it's from Owen Exeter, who's uh, based on the Pen Rin. He says, uh, thanks, Tom. Do you see any unusual behavior, reaction, displacement, post-release, implying adverse catch and release angling impacts? So when we do the tagging procedure, we, we catch the fish and we implant the transmitter tag. Um, and we can't we can't distinguish between whether the fish are being shocked by the actual being caught or the actual procedure. But we, we do certainly see the fish basically when we release them, they just sit still. They, they go into the deep water channel and then they just sit there for um, maybe a week or so. Um, but uh, other than that, we can't we can't really say much about whether they're affected by recreational fishing. But there is there was a paper published which. Um, looked at the impact of recreational fishing on bass and I think it was like seen as quite low um, but that's all we really know about it. And we have another question um, it's from an anonymous attendee but he says were mature bass tagged in the estuaries or were they mostly juvenile fish? So initially we were focusing on juvenile fish. So they're about four years old, which is a, still juvenile for a bass. Um, but in the last batch of fish, we tagged um, a lot of six year old, seven year old individuals and in the X and the team. Um, and we also did get some other bigger fish within the dart estuary as well. So um, we have got quite a broad spread of ages. I think they go from uh, three up to about seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. um, and with this future work that we're trying to do, we are going to be focusing on um, like m more mature fish, basically catching them at other location, other coastal sites, basically. Great. And you all have absolutely no fun at all, do you, going out angling for sea bass on estuaries? It looks awful. <laughs> so I've got a question from Nick. I think we'll have this as the last question, but Tom, there are loads of questions in the Q&A, so you can answer some of those offline as well. Yeah. But uh, Nick says... Um, do bass organise themselves as meta populations centred on nursery areas? Um, so that's that's the that's the theory that they have these sort of small populations, these meta populations. Um, we don't know whether it's specifically focused on the nursery area, but we just do know that they have an affinity to a particular location. Um, so whether that's a particular feeding site, so it might be a rocky reef or a wreck, or it might be an estuarine site, um, but we don't know whether they're particularly focused on the estuaries or these other sort of other feeding locations, basically, but they do definitely have this affinity and site fidelity to specific locations. Great. Well, thank you, Tom. It was a brilliant presentation, um, a good quick fire round of questions that you had there and um, please do go into the Q&A because there's lots of people who are really interested in your work. Um, so we're going to move on to our next speaker and our next speaker is Matthew Ashley and Matt is a research fellow here at the University of Plymouth and Matt leads a range of different projects um, but mostly focusing on marine natural capital and today he will be introducing us to some of the recent work that he has been leading um, in Plymouth. So go ahead, Matt. Hi there, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, so yeah, thanks Sean, I'm Matt Ashley, Research Fellow at University of Plymouth, and going to be talking about some of the natural capital work um, that we've been doing. So that's a team of um, uh, Sean, uh, Tom Mullier has been helping a lot of data, spatial mapping, spatial analysis, and um, fantastic um, computer, computer knowledge and programming and modelling work. Um, and this is sort of developing work that we started in North Devon and carried on the Isles of Scilly, looking at sort of the, the amount of habitats and species populations, uh, the health, their condition, and then how that relates to the benefits that people get. So the ecosystem service benefits uh, for people and communities. Um, it, and the work I'm going to present today is um, a NERC sweep funded project. Um, and so the idea behind sweep is to provide impact, provide input into um, whether it's management, policy or activities that are going on with partner organisations and really pro provide some useful work. Um, so for this project, uh, we're looking at, uh, at Plymouth, Plymouth Sound and Estuaries SAC and out in the sort of proposed National Marine Park area in the first stage of that. 
but we've sort of we've teamed up with the um, Tamar Estuaries Consultative Forum and Natural England because um, conveniently the Tamar Estuaries Management Plan is up for is up and being reviewed at the moment, and this sits perfectly with this sort of ethos of these natural capital projects and assets and risk registers because at the heart of it is the designations, so the SAC and the SPA, but then really looking at the activities, the risks, the pressures to the habitats in there, but then looking at the wider gains and economic and social benefits that the management actions can bring about by addressing some of the issues that are occurring. Um, and of course, I'm sure many of you are aware, but for those not in the Southwest, Plymouth sort of a reasonably large city, it has very sort of large naval port as well. Um, it's surrounded by some beautiful countryside, but a lot of agricultural land. And then going up to Dartmoor, um, there's a lot of historic mining that's happened up there. So there's quite a lot of pressures, whether that's um, water pollution for a mine, historical mine, um, mine works, agricultural runoff, or the general sort of uh, uh, challenges you have of a largely populated city right on a very beautiful sort of marine landscape. Um, so I have the next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, this is this is moving on from work we started in the North Devon Marine Pioneer, uh, where we sort of uh, a couple of years ago, two to three years ago, sort of started to look at providing a natural capital and asset and risk register, something that's sort of very sort of um, current in the sort of 25 year environment plans, very current in UK government thinking, but European and global thinking too, of really looking at this link between the environment and the benefits that people get from it. Um, so we're really looking at those ecosystem service benefits and how changing condition in the environment affects those benefits we receive. Um, we then developed the project further by uh, using it to address um, fisheries management issues. We worked with Arsa Silly um, IFCA and looked at the implications of different potential bylaws and management measures and what that meant not only for the fishery and for the fishing industry in the Arsa Silly and further afield, but also for the state of the habitats and the delivery or provision of ecosystem services beyond just the provision of wild food and fisheries, but also recreation and tourism, clean water and sediments, um, healthy climate, carbon sequestration, obviously at the moment with the climate crisis and, um, and, um, and sea defence. So what we've come to now with Plymouth is through, thank, thankfully through SWEEP, the benefit of being able to keep developing these approaches and the great thing about Plymouth, obviously, is there's so much good work going on here at the moment and in the southwest, and the amount of organisations and resources we're able to um, to collaborate with on this project. So, obviously, being able to gather data that's already collected by the Environment Agency, by the Devon and Cornwall and uh, Devon and Seven and Cornwall Lifkers. Um, obviously, as you've heard possibly this morning, there's um, there's the Remedies project, particularly around seagrass in the Plymouth Sound. So, being able to collaborate strongly with Natural England, the West Country Rivers Trust, who are leading some work in the sound on that, on the mapping side and the ecology side. Um, but also sort of looking at what the work in the Environment Agency is at the moment, going back to that thinking about natural capital and the fact that the Environment Agency are looking at how their water, water framework directive indicators can be used to, um, to influence or input into natural capital approaches. Um, and as ever with, with Plymouth especially, but throughout the UK, the, the resources available through Marlin and the MBA for looking at the sensitivity of habitats and the local knowledge we've got um, through the expertise of Heidi, Harvey and, and Keith with the MBA and their local knowledge of the area. Um, so we just have the next slide, please. So our aim in Plymouth is really to obviously develop these approaches, but also to look at how we can integrate some of this, this more sort of detailed spatial knowledge uh, through the projects such as Remedies, through the knowledge of the Environment Agency and the WFD monitoring, and sort of build this natural capital um, asset register and risk register to the next stage. Um, really sort of work on improving kind of the work we've done with indicators in the past and how this sits with kind of bigger national projects such as the um, natural capital atlases that Natural England are producing. And as I mentioned, the um, natural capital monitoring through the water framework directive indicators that Environment Agency are reviewing at the moment. Um, but before we get onto that, as ever, these projects generally start with looking at the ecosystem service benefits we're getting from the habitats. And the great thing about Plymouth is this amazing array of habitats. Um, we've got a bonanza of very, very sort of valuable habitats in terms of ecosystem service provision. Um, so thinking of the fisheries nurse, nursery grounds and the salt marsh, such as uh, Tom might have just mentioned earlier, um, you know, those, those salt marshes really 
provide not just those wild food benefits of fish nursery areas, they have huge benefits or significant benefits. So that darker shading in this table um, represents larger or greater benefits, significant benefits, and across the board for tourism and nature watching, recreation, um, they also provide sea defense or flooding, um, water storage benefits, um, carbon sequestration, healthy climate benefits, and uh, mitigation of pollutants as well. Um, and similar with the seagrass habitats in pink below them in that table, um, you've got a range of benefits. So the gray is a moderate contribution, the black significant contribution and lighter gray is a low or sort of low to moderate contribution. So again, seagrass prevent providing quite a large array of moderate to significant contributions. And those numbers in that table represent the confidence we have in the evidence. So one is expert opinion, two is grey literature or overseas peer-reviewed literature, and, um, and three is good agreement between peer-reviewed literature. So, so we've, we've, we've got some very valuable habitats with those two, but what we've really discovered in the other work we've done in North Devon, the Alza Silly, and again here, it's really the combination of habitats, those overall benefits, and the way those habitats link to, it's really important to consider, because having just salt marsh and seagrass isn't really providing those ecosystem service benefits. And we've really discovered this in recent years as literature and reviews have developed around carbon sequestration, and healthy climate, that the particular benefits through that combination of habitats through, particularly through the carbon sequestration by the um, flora with roots, such as the salt marsh and seagrass in situ, but then also the fact that um, terrestrial organic matter, intertidal organic matter from algal communities and kelp forests, etc., is transported through estuaries and through Plymouth Sound, for instance, out into deeper sediments and, um, and buried by reworking by, by sort of um, existing processes in those deeper subtidal sediments. So it's really the link between the, the processes and the, um, the concept that you really need or really want to have all of those habitats in good functional state to provide these existing service benefits, whether it's the current climate crisis and healthy climates, clean water and sediments, or even sort of more personal ones such as tourism, recreation, or supporting a fishing industry. Um, so just jump to the next slide, please. Okay, so just to summarize, for Plymouth, what we've what we found so far, and these are the um, the indicators we use are generally the condition assessments in SACs, and then when we go further offshore, then we're looking at the, um, the in interaction of pressures such as demersal fishing with the sensitivity of habitats to those pressures, um, because there's not necessarily condition assessments further offshore. Um, so currently in Plymouth, um, we've, got, um, we've got threats from Pacific oyster colonization through the intertidal sediments, anchoring and mooring in the seagrass, as you've heard earlier, um, so that's provided this, um, this negative or declining condition of those habitats. Um, further offshore, um, generally assessed as stable, but we've, we're currently running a, um, an interaction between those pressures and activi activities and pressures and the habitats to understand better what's happening offshore in these areas. Um, but what I want to flag up here is really what we're trying to do at the moment is to build on that knowledge and information we're getting from projects such as Remedies. Um, this improved data we're getting through the WFD indicators for environment agency and applying this because these current asset registers that we've been producing generally red flag areas across a whole site if they're not meeting those targets. But we really want to understand spatially where those, where those pressures are and where those issues are and understand how the management and issues can, can, uh, can benefit them. So I just have the next slide, please. Um, so just to, to repeat on that, for the, um, for the water quality, we're looking, we generally look at the water um, body status. And again, it tends to be red flagged if across a whole water body asset, like Tamar, Plymouth Sound, Plymouth Coast or Yelm, um, is not meeting those good or high status required by the WFD. Um, so we're really looking at the WFD indicator data that the Environment Agency is collecting locally and um, trying to build that more spatially specific indicator data into these um, asset and risk registers um, to be able to identify where the issues are and then identify where mitigation takes place or um, could take place and what the benefits of that would be. So if I just jump to the last slide, please. Okay, so this is, this is our sort of final point at the moment where we produce this risk register, which generally is looking down the one side at the ecosystem service benefits, so food, healthy climate, et cetera. And then along the top is looking at the habitats and we're looking at policy targets here. So if the condition assessments are not meeting targets, if the water 
framework directive assessments not meeting targets, then it will be uh, an amber uh, below target or even a red substantially below target. If they're at targets, it's generally green. Um, if it's declined or a declining trend, we tend to see a lower, so the ambers with the Cs in them, if it's declined recently, etc. And where we've got good evidence, uh, we have a solid cover colour, and where we have a lighter shade, it's where we haven't got great evidence. So at the moment, this project's ongoing, and we're looking to build in those more detailed indicators to improve those areas with the lighter colours. But what we want to do as well is go back to that um, estuaries management and look at the issues, look at the management objectives in that, and particularly for the area that Remedies was looking at that you saw in the earlier presentation, for instance, be able to look that if those mitigation attempts around the seagrass are successful, what would the change be in this table? And the same for the water quality issues. If mitigation successful uh, attempts are successful, where they're taking place, what would be the implications for this, for this risk table and to be able to pr produce forecasts essentially. So thank you very much for the time and I'm happy to take any questions because there's quite a lot of detail in there. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, we do, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, um, but I'm going to lead uh, with my question first because I can. Um, but the first question is, is this is going to be the first time that a natural capital approach is going to be applied to the management of a European marine site. Um, what do you think that this approach will bring that is potentially a new lens or novel? Um, I think, well, traditionally, sort of European marine sites, et cetera, are managed through looking at case issues or looking at the conservation advice. And I think we're able to bring a, a slightly sort of more detailed level. So identify, for instance, in that conservation advice, whether it's for Pacific oysters, or whether it's for anchoring and mooring, um, it's provide a, a new level of detail to those assessments and to provide some evidence on how mitigation could be successful and what that could mean. But also I think it sort of changes the thinking necessarily from that feature-based approach to looking at how improving those features relates to the delivery or the benefit or the benefit provision from e-system service benefits. So if you can understand that you're improving a feature from a unfavorable conservation objective, then what does that mean in terms of ecosystem service benefits? And what's that mean for individuals and societies? Okay, great. Um, actually, we have one in the um, in the chat here. It's actually a dare from Bob Earl, mm -hmm. and he says, "Pacific oysters bad, native oysters good." I dare you to differentiate between the ecosystem benefits between these two species, and I suppose that is a very good point, isn't it? Because they're listed, um, but in terms of what they do, uh, functionally, yeah, go on. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, it depends where you. If you focus just on filtration benefits and sort of uh, water, not necessarily pollution, but sort of um, uh, sediment benefits, then yeah, definitely Pacific Oyster providing a, providing a service. I think as involved um, in the early stages of the project that uh, Natural England and uh, Cornwall Wildlife Trust have been working on intensely. Um, so that was actually looking at Pacific oyster, trialing Pacific oyster management issues, but also looking at kind of beneficial uses of them, because if you look at the Dutch case studies, they're here potentially to stay in some form or another. Um, so I think it would be interesting to provide the ecosystem service assessment, but I think the, the, the challenge always is the Pacific oysters um, spread so exponentially, and not only is that leading to a change in the um, the species communities in the sort of intertidal area, but also there's that challenge for ecosystem services where people access the shoreline and the injuries they, they provide and so on. So I think it'd be a really interesting assessment side by side. Um, I always think it's quite interesting as well. I believe native oysters were brought here by the Romans, but I'm not too sure. I need uh, some of the experts such as Keith and Matt Slater to, uh, to yeah. check on that. And that's where we start to get into that sort of that older debate really isn't it about what is invasive and what do we actually want do we want yeah anyway i we could go on for ages about that but there's lots of um stuff in the chat there and that maybe you might want to get back to later matt um we have a question here and i think it's to do with the framework um where's it gone uh Jean-Luc asks don't the filter feeders on reef habitats provide clean water 
via filtration on the ecosystem service benefits, but it's not on the table. So it's the, the table um, with, the, with the main ecosystem services. And I guess John Luke is asking why aren't filter feeders on reefs um, on that table? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's th those tables have been sort of constantly evolving. Um, we started with the, with the Devon work reviewing original tables that were developed by the um, uh, by sort of Travis Potts team. Um, and then we've been sort of reviewing that as more data comes up and, and we, we find more out through um, for experts opinion and further reviews. So um, certainly it's something to, something to look at. And I think from if it was going down to further biotopes and communities, then when we get into sort of muscle beds and muscle um, communities, et cetera, and Pacific filter feeding biotopes, then it is flagged up. Um, when we're looking at kind of the broad scale um, reef communities, et cetera. So for instance, we've had a lot of work recently looking at the role of kelp in carbon sequestration, the role of kelp detritus reaching deeper seas. So really separating where kelp communities are for their potential role in that area. And I think you're right, Luke, that, Sean, Luke, that there's an area to look at the, um, the role of the different biotopes and really break up kind of, you know, from, from this wider sort of, keep referring to unis levels, but this sort of circulatory rock, infralitoral rock that really kind of point out the importance of different communities. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Matt. There are questions um, in the Q&A um, and some discussion in the chat for maybe you to just um, have a look at and try and answer as we go along. Um, but thank you very much. Look forward to the report that is end of March-ish, isn't it? That's right, yeah. So plenty yeah. of work. <laughs> okay, great. So our next speakers um, are Carl Warham and Ruth Williams. And Carl is a senior environment officer from the environmental growth team at Cornwall County Council. And Ruth is the marine conservation manager for Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Um, and together they're going to share their initial thoughts on the nature recovery plan. So please go ahead, Carl. Thank you, Sean. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us today. Uh, so, yeah, as, as Sean said, I'm, I'm, I'm Carl. I work within the Council's strategic environment team. Um, we're essentially the bit that works on uh, nature and the ecological emergency. So alongside our sister team, which works on the climate emergency and manages the climate change action plan. Um, so I'll, I also work really closely with the Cornwall and Oz, Oz of Sully Local Nature Partnership. Um, and I'll mention that just because the plan I'm going to talk about is being co-developed with them. So it's uh, a certain it's certainly not just a Cornwall Council um, project. Um, so today I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to the developing nature recovery plan for Cornwall, which we want you to help shape. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, first, I'd, I'd, I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, um, but nature's of course in real trouble. Last year there was report after report saying how serious the ecological crisis is with declines in wildlife globally, nationally and locally. So we know that 41% of species declined uh, in the UK last year. Uh, since, uh, sorry, over, not, not, uh, actually, uh, since 1970, um, and 14 out of 24 of government's own biodiversity indicators are going in the wrong direction, uh, whilst it was none of the global targets were met last year. Um, so the problem we also know is severe in Cornwall too, so we currently have a report that we've commissioned the Wildlife Trust to do, um, it's coming out like this spring that tells, us, that tells a similar story overall for us, us locally. Um, but there's, of course, some grounds for hope, uh, hopefully. Um, so in 2021 in particular, of course, the, the eyes of the world will be on Cornwall and our natural environment for the G7. Um, so alongside COP26 and COP15, um, this could hopefully be a pivotal year um, politically uh, for, for the environment in particular. Um, so now is a sort of ideal time to ensure we're getting... Uh, getting things right for nature locally and set in the right direction. Um, and that means that we need a plan to help nature recover um, that everyone in Cornwall hopefully can get behind. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as you'll no doubt not have missed, um, as an important piece of context, the Environment Bill, um, government's uh, major post-Brexit um, legislation on the environment, is now sadly delayed. But one feature of it um, on this slide here is worth highlighting, and that's a requirement on local councils to create a local nature recovery strategy, um, which will say how local areas will protect nature locally. Um, so when this becomes law, councils will have to make these plans every five years and report on how good we do in achieving them. Uh, next slide, please. So why am I talking to you about this now before it's law? Um, well, I don't need to tell you that 
There's lots of great work going on across Cornwall, only some of which are listed here. We also created a strategy, our own strategy for nature already um, five years ago, our environmental growth strategy, which was updated just this year. Um, so as a result of all this work, government have asked Cornwall to be one of only five places um, to pilot creating a local nature recovery strategy um, before they become law as part of a pilot scheme. Uh, next slide, please. So what will the plan do locally? I mean, basically, it will be a strategic document that outlines priorities for what, where and how we can best support nature. Um, it will cover the whole of Cornwall. Um, and though it's not required nationally, we want to make sure as we'll cover marine the marine environment too. Um, and hopefully we're trying to demonstrate through the pilot that that, that, that can be done, that marine can be brought within scope. Um, so ultimately, we'll define what we think our priorities will be for the next five years, what habitats or species we want to most improve, um, what natural processes we care most about and what environmental or social outcomes we want to aim for. And these might be anything from wildfire habitats for pollinators to more woodlands and wetlands to fight climate change or more urban green spaces. I think. Um, we'll also be creating a map of where the best terrestrial opportunities are, which you can see here, um, which is, is a prototype on this, on this slide, um, which show our, what our best evidence says are the best locations to take action. Next slide, please. And so the plan will do a few different jobs once in place. It will help us boost the profile of nature as a way of tackling climate change and, and flooding, of course, um, and identify where they could best be implemented. Hopefully help us attract uh, funding to invest in new projects. There's already some work underway on that. Um, help us, importantly, shape our local planning framework for new developments um, in the terrestrial case. So helping to shape our commitments to biodiversity net gain, amongst other things. And finally, it will also help us shape the future scheme for how, how nature friendly farming um, will be funded um, through the environmental land management scheme too. And so ultimately it will help us deliver our longer term strategy as well, which goes to 2065 um, within the shorter five year chunks. Next slide please. Um, so this means we'll essentially have a full set of plans uh, for action on how we can best support the environment. Um, many of you may have helped shape the, the new 2050 Cornwall plan, which is a really long term high level vision uh, or our updated environmental growth strategy. Those set the long term direction uh, for how to tackle environmental challenges. But our nature recovery plan will be the final piece in the jigsaw that says how we'll work on the next five years specifically for nature. So what we want from you now is, is views on the marine bit what the marine bit should cover. So whether that's seal, seagrass, salt marsh, mud mill, HPMAs, whatever. Um, so I'm just going to let Ruth talk a little bit more about that. Cool. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please, Alistair. Um, so yeah, as Carl said, I'm going to quickly go over some of the marine nature recovery um, work and sort of the thinking that we've, we're starting to have on, on how do we restore Cornwall seas. Next slide, please. Um, as we all know in this, this virtual room today, we've got an incredible diversity and wealth of wildlife um, here in the UK and particularly down here in the southwest. But many of these animals and the habitats that support them are under increasing threats from us, from, from human induced pressures, from pollution and poor water quality, from disturbance, from an ever increasing use of our seas, from development and the destructive impacts of fishing. Next slide, please. But there are solutions. Um, we've just heard from Carl about the local nature recovery strategy and the plans for, for growing nature here in Cornwall. But the current environment bill does not include the marine environment in these plans for local nature recovery strategies. They stop at mean low water springs. So, so what about our seas? And as part of the terrestrial pilot in Cornwall, we're working on a parallel piece of work to determine what we can do to help our seas recover as well. What work, uh, this work is, it's going to be setting the criteria for how we um, assess that success and also the priorities for how and where we want that recovery to start to happen locally within, whoops, within this first five years. And we really want your input as key stakeholders to, to help inform that future work, which I'll get onto in a moment. But the first part of that work is to define what we really mean by marine nature recovery and what do we need to do to achieve it. So quite simply, in my mind, recovery is about giving nature the space and the time to enable it to recover and thrive. This can be through either active restoration projects such as seagrass reseeding or salt marsh restoration, or by more passive measures, which are often more simple and, and realistically more cost effective, um, such as removing the pressures to allow nature to recover itself. We've already heard some of these this morning about the recovery that we've seen in Lime Bay, um, and the Remedies Project looking at restoring seagrass beds. Next slide, please. 
Um, at sea, we already have a network of marine protected areas. Um, in UK waters, this network covers an area about nine times the size of Wales, which sounds pretty impressive. And within Cornish waters, we have 34% within our marine protected area network. We've all heard about the 30 by 30 campaign to work towards getting 30% of our seas protected by 2030, which loads of countries have now signed up to by the, uh, through the, the Global Alliance. So are we ahead of the game if we've already got 34% in MPAs in Cornwall? Next slide, please. Um, sadly not. As expected, when you look at the detail, only 7% of our Cornish MPAs are actually delivering protection through active manage management measures, things like bylaws, to directly control those damaging activities within those areas. And that's represented by that tiny little slice in this, this um, overall blue picture. Most of our MPAs still have no management in them whatsoever. Um, so currently they're just lines on maps. And just designating sites is not enough. They have to be effectively managed to be able to reduce their pressures and to allow this recovery. Most MPAs are also multi-use. So some activities can continue if they don't impact the specific feature that that site is designated for. So it's crucial that the MPA network includes highly protected marine areas, these HPMAs. These sites are where all extractive and destructive um, activities have been banned um, and the recent re Benyon report and is hopefully going to be responded to soon by DEFRA and we fully support the, the principle of HPMAs and believe that they will be invaluable tools to monitor and show how different marine habitats can recover if allowed and we hope to see some of these pilots uh, sites trialled as soon as possible. Next slide please. So what about the wider seas? MPAs only protect specific features within their specific areas. We really have to consider that gap, uh, those gaps, the areas outside those MPAs, and think about the wider measures, um, particularly for species that are more mobile. Some management of wider seas can be achieved through um, national things like marine planning, through licensing, um, fisheries management, and working towards delivery of good environmental status through the marine UK strategy. Um, although many of these things haven't been developed for recovery per se. And some of this work is, as we know, painfully slow. It relies too heavily on political will and often requires changes to legislation or policy, which then holds everything up. And this has to change. We need to be far more proactive in putting the environment first, or at least equal to economic and social drivers, if we are to see real recovery quickly. And we can all help by our local action choices too. We can help to reduce the amount of plastic entering our seas by simple personal choices to reduce at source. We can uh, buy our fish from sustainable sources and uh, check out the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide for, for more information. We can raise awareness of the consequences of people's actions and encouraging positive behaviour change. Things like watching wildlife safely to reduce disturbance. So marine nature recovery, in terms of its definition, is about ensuring proper management of our marine protected areas, as well as using the tools we have to sustainably manage the wider seas. It's about reducing pressures where we can and letting nature recover, but also lending a helping hand where active restoration is needed. Um, but to see wildlife and our seas recover, we really need to start acting now. We've heard this time and time again, and we've got to use the evidence we already have and the tools we know that work. So next slide, please. Um, this is where our thinking is at. We, how do we prioritise this action locally? Where do we start? So we would like your input now. So um, to help us develop the marine nature recovery work here in Cornwall, um, which will hopefully roll out wider, um, I ask you all to go to Menti via the, um, this link, www.menti.com, on your phone or laptop now. And when prompted, enter, enter the code that's here. Um, Hopefully somebody can put that in the chat as well. Um, and there's just one question that we'd like your, your feedback on, please. Um, and that is, uh, what are your top three priorities for Cornwall in the next five years? So, you know, what do you think we need to do and where for Cornwall's nature recovery? So, um, Alistair, if you could share the, the Menti final results page, that will scroll and we'll leave that up just to get your, your input and we can record that then as we take some of the questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, I think Emma's put a, a link in the chat. Is that the correct link, Carl? I think you wanted... Um... Yes, that's the one, yeah, thank you. Great, okay. Um, and we've just got a couple of minutes to go. Uh, so we'll ask, uh, I'll put some questions forward. Um, 
There is one question from uh, oh, Quakers. Lots of questions that are coming through. Uh, where do I start? Um, Guy is asking, Guy Hooper says, how do we know what recovery looks like for marine habitats? Is there an issue of shifting baselines? Mm -hmm. This is a, yeah, a real key question um, and something that we're, we're discussing and seem to go round and round in circles for. Um, we are going to be producing criteria for how we measure um, success and measure that recovery um, for things like um, reducing pressures um, and getting more effective management in MPAs. I think there has to be a proxy that by reducing those pressures, you do or, or you know you will automatically have have some sort of recovery um, within the timeframes that we're looking at. I don't think it's realistic to, to monitor every species and every habitat to the level that we would need to, to scientifically prove that and statistically prove that. So I think there has to be some element of, of proxy um, and looking to recover and it's, if it's going in the right direction. Great. And we have um, a question from Amelia Bridges, who says, where do nature recovery plans fit into local neighbourhood development plans from a local government perspective? So I guess that's you, Carl. That's a, a, a crucial question, um, and unfortunately that's not altogether too clear just yet, but that's one aspect of the pilot that we're working on. So we're working closely with colleagues um, locally in our planning teams, um, and a big, a big means by which it will be implemented within Cornwall specifically will be through our climate change development plan, planning document, um, which was, has just been released for its final stage of consultation. Um, if you want to Google it, um, you can, there's still a chance to input on that. Um, but in, in terms of the national setup, we still don't know that and government are still talking uh, between themselves and various departments to shape up exactly how that will be. But of course, um, we're hoping that through our conversations with planning colleagues, we'll be able to influence that, that national direction and ensure it has as teeth but yeah sorry that's not a, that's not a very satisfying or definitive answer just now but we've got a yeah we share your ambition that it has teeth in, in the planning system i guess uh, there's some other questions there as well I and mean, sam park also asks you know um what's the greatest challenge to implementing the marine plan is it politics um so it is a, there is a lot of politics i think to play in this there is a lot of politics yes um and a lot of um a lot of difficulties in getting specific management through. Um, so, you know, right down to, to getting simple bylaws through um, with IFCAS, the, the impact assessments that we have to um, provide are so skewed towards um, the costs of fisheries that, that it's, and it's, as we know, it's very difficult to put economic value on the benefits and, and to, to provide that sort of balance um, is just almost impossible. And the, the you know, I think the, the realistic benefits for um, recovery to um, to everyone, including industries, development, but particularly fishing industries, really needs to be um, advocated more strongly. You know, we've got the evidence now from from the likes of Lime Bay, from Lundy, from other areas um, globally that that particularly high protected marine areas really do work and we've got to get that that message across and yeah the politics need to lead from the, the start to get that across and and get management in place more easily than we do at the moment right yeah yes you yeah we're in a better space than when reference areas were first mentioned yes hopefully. so yeah unfortunately we don't have time for any more questions but yeah because you've had some good feedback from your um mentimeter so hopefully that can go through to your consultation the g7 in carbis bay is so exciting let's hope the sun shines for them and they don't get a howling southwesterly um when they come to visit beautiful cornwall and and the marine spaces and we hope marine features really highly in that so really appreciate it thank you Thank you both. And also, yeah, you do have lots more stuff in the Q&A. So, so have a look at that and see if you can get back to people. So our final speaker is James Stewart. And thank you, James. Um, James is a senior environment officer for the Devon and Seven IFCA. Um, and today he's going to give us an update on the fisheries research and management plans. So are you ready to go, James? Yep, thank you, Sean. As Sean said, I'm the Senior Environment Officer at Devon 7 IFCA, um, but actually I'm presenting this on behalf of Martin Peverley, um, the FRMP officer who, you know, has, has really led this work. I'd like to use this time to talk about 
the fisheries research and management plans, uh, where they've come from, what they are, and where we'd like to go with them. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So the 25 year environment plan really is the key background to this, um, which set out the government's vision to improve and restore the environment, um, including by using an ecosystem approach to sustainable fisheries management. Now, DEFRA Marine and Fisheries established a Marine Pioneer Programme, which has been mentioned a couple of times um, this morning, which was set up to trial innovative approaches um, and inform delivery of the 25 year environment plan with the intention that projects or lessons learned um, <clears throat> that were sort of locally delivered could be scaled up and applied at a national level. Now the Marine Pioneer in North Devon, again highlighted among many other things, that there's a need for fisheries managers to apply an ecosystem-based approach that prioritizes the protection of natural assets um, while supporting sustainable and viable fishing. And the Pioneer, really identified the development of FRMPs as a key step towards achieving that. So as part of the Marine Pioneer and leading on now that program's finished, the IFCA, um, in collaboration with the North Devon Biosphere, have produced a series of fisheries research and management plans for commercially important species in the north of Devon and Seven IFCA's district. Um, the district is shown on this map on the right here. Um, the, the set of FRMPs I'm talking about today focuses on the north um, area shaded in grey. <clears throat> so just a quick profile really of the IFCA and the biosphere for those who aren't familiar. The IFCA are statutory government inshore fisheries managers um, whose districts like you see here cover baselines to six nautical miles um, and there are 10 regional IFCAs around the coast um, of England which have a shared vision really to champion and manage a sustainable marine environment and inshore fisheries, securing a balance between social, environmental and economic benefits. Um, I've also worked on this. Um, they really look to improve the relationships between people and the environment. Um, and that spans an area of land and sea in North Devon, um, which is very relevant to the development of these FRMPs. <coughs> Could I have the next slide, please? So what is a, an FRMP? Um, these basically use a localized and ecosystem-based approach to summarize the current knowledge regarding a given species ecology, uh, the fisheries that depend on the species and the relevant management measures that apply to it. Now, as part of this ecosystem approach, the FRMP also give a comprehensive overview of the range of pressures facing the species in their habitats. Um, whether those pressures are natural or, or human induced. Now these reviews have involved a thorough review of the evidence available in journals, grey literature, um, regulator and industry reports and historical sources. But it's, it's been clear, clear that developing improved fisheries knowledge and management really requires participation of stakeholders to ensure that we get a wide range of, of perspective and expertise and that that's applied to co-developing solutions. So stakeholder engagement really has been at the heart of FRMPs, um, including individuals we hope who are, tend to be harder to reach or feel uh, less well represented by management as it currently stands. So with that in mind, we've supplemented the sort of more formal literature review with uh, local knowledge gathered through semi-structured interviews um, which were held with fishers who are or have been active in the north of the district um, and with individuals who have fished in the area or have been involved in the fishing industry. Now, having set out the evidence relating to each species and the, the fisheries, the plans identified knowledge gaps so that the IFCA and other organisations uh, can take a rational, sort of prioritised approach to future research in the southwest. Really, we'd like to see the FRMPs used by researchers to develop uh, timely research projects that are relevant to management and policy, as well as being you know, ecologically interesting. The FRMPs also uh, provide recommendations for fisheries management. And where it's realistic and appropriate, these recommendations make the case for local, sustainable and ecosystem-based 
approaches. Um, I think it's true to say that typically we're finding that much more research is needed, particularly in the Southwest, um, in order to inform potential management measures. But there are some proposals that could be explored uh, sooner rather than later. Now, really, we hope that the FRMPs can be used by a wide range of stakeholders, um, partly as a comprehensive source of fish and fisheries knowledge, which is relevant to the Southwest, but our district in particular. Um, for example, in evaluating the impacts of human activity on fisheries, fish, and their habitats. And it can also be used to engage with other organizations in encouraging research um, and in the implementation of fisheries management plans under the Fisheries Act. So can I have the next slide, please? We'll just talk a bit about what's kind of been done so far. Now, the first set of plans, as I say, is focused on the north of the district, um, which really has a diverse mix of uh, fishers and fisheries, including full and part-time seasonal fishers who use a range of gears. Now, the key, well, the, the ports in the areas include places like Minehead, Appledore, uh, Clovelly, and Biddeford, but really Ilfracum is uh, has you know the highest landings by tonnage and by value. <clears throat> now the the FRMPs have been produced initially for five species. Each of these was chosen in collaboration with industry, um, but also with the marine working group of the marine pioneer. Um, and each each species had its own kind of set of reasons for being chosen, which I'll just go through briefly. So herring in the top centre there isn't really fished extensively or at high volumes in the area but there are small scale almost artisanal fisheries that have existed for generations so a lot of the value associated with herring is cultural to fisheries in their communities so it's important to that we take this into account um, another species is is uh, bass which is one of the more challenging species for fisheries managers um, because of their high commercial and recreational interest but also because of the large areas that they, they cover in terms of the migrations. Uh, whelks and the skates and rays grouping um, are actually in the top three landings by weight and by value <coughs> to Ilfracum. Um, so they're obvious choices for the FRMPs. And whelk has been particularly interesting because it's got really rapidly uh, rising overseas demand um, and has therefore become one of the more important commercial shellfish fisheries in the UK overall. <clears throat> and it's also a valuable non-quota species, um, which has non-restricted entry to the fishery. So they've become really quite important to the inshore fleet in terms of a displacement fishery. And then finally, uh, squid is the fifth FRMP uh, in this iteration. They're really mainly a bycatch in trawl fisheries. Um, but can be reasonably high value, and they represent a possible alternative catch for those hoping to diversify from overfished fin fish stocks. Um, but really very little is known about squid populations or the potential for targeted fisheries to, um, to target those. So they, they make you know, really an interesting set of five case studies to start with, with these FRMPs. Now, could I have the next slide, please? So through the plans, um, we've made a, over 30 specific recommendations for research management and fisheries development. Um, it'd be great to go into more detail on all of them, uh, but I only have time, unfortunately, to go into a couple for today. Uh, the first, Sort of recommendations I'd like to talk about um, is to better understand the size of maturity and whelk populations, um, which appear to be, you know, that they show considerable variation around the coast, you know, around the southwest. Um, the IFCA has previously studied this in the area and put in place a higher minimum conservation reference size than the national CRS. But really, it's important to continue this work to establish how effective that has been and to input into into discussions surrounding uh, management of whelk elsewhere and to consider the utility of trialing an extension of, um, of this minimum CRS to waters beyond the six nautical mile limit. 
to you know um, to extend protections further out to sea. Now we've heard from Tom today about the inshore movement of bass, um, which is really likely to be very important for future fisheries and marine management, and um, including bass nursery areas, as Tom mentioned. And we also have evidence of specific spawning populations of herring in inshore areas in the north of the district that appear to be genetically distinct from nearby spawning populations. So for both of these species and others, we'd really like to see some research into their wider movements and their habitat uses, um, as well as interactions between what we might consider the local populations and populations elsewhere, which would help to inform really the best approach to managing these species, including in response to marine developments that have uh, a high potential to threaten local populations, uh, particularly in central fish habitat areas. So these are just a, a small selection. Um, and among many others, we also have recommendations for research into spawning and nursery ground for species like herring and skates and rays, as well as things like um, sustainability certifications and other methods to add value to some of these really small scale inshore fisheries and ways of improving stakeholder engagement and collaboration, um, not only to help the environmental research side of things, but also to uh, help enforce or to help uh, institute more kind of intelligence led enforcement operations in the district. Um, now on a, another slightly different point I'd like to make is that we're actually really excited at the prospect of this work feeding into broader scale policy and management, uh, which will be implemented following the Fisheries Act. Um, in particular, the fisheries management plans, which will come from that, are yet to be developed. And the MMO are looking into the uh, evidence requirements for these, which our FRMPs will be able to inform. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is the, the last slide. And sort of just looking to the future, we're, we're hoping to extend the project for at least a further two years um, in order to, to continue this stakeholder engagement that we've been involved with, with the fishing industry, uh, scientists and others to inform the development of further plans. Um, and in that time, develop a further eight fisheries research and management plans for species across the district. So not just the north, also the, the south coast which we hope will feed into both district and national level um, research and management. Also use that opportunity to basically keep an eye on um, sort of evidence regarding the first five FRMPs that I've talked about today, ensuring they're up to date with the evidence and that options for management that we've highlighted are suggested um, as and when appropriate. So just to provide a quick insight, I guess, the species that are under consideration for future FRMPs, um, they're kind of up for discussion and input, but include scallops, spur dog, cod, solemn place, as well as um, some of the sort of other crustaceans. Um, and an initial effort towards assessing non-quota species might be considered quite valuable in terms of informing debate around effort management um, and other recreationally important species are under consideration. Um, but I think I'll leave that there for now and just hopefully there's a bit of time for questions. So thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, James. Um, we have run out of time, but the, um, we, can, we can just throw one or two questions at you very quickly. Um, there was one interesting question which seems to have disappeared from the Q&A, but it was about how will fisheries research management plans join up across ICA districts? Sorry, could you repeat that quickly? How would the fisheries research and management plans potentially um, uh, join up across different IFCA districts? That's a really good question. Um, so at the moment, we're the only IFCA, as far as I know, who are developing this kind of plan. Um, but obviously the, the fisheries, particularly in the, the, the adjoining districts, um, have some kind of interaction. So there'll always be crosstalk between the districts. Um, and we hope that the plans as they're developing now will feed into the kind of national level fisheries management plans under the Fisheries Act. Great. Uh, to sort of guide how 
more uniform plans can be developed uh, across areas. And uh, a quick question from Bob is, what is the time frame for the planning cycle? So in terms of actually publishing these, we've got the five at the moment, um, we're hoping to publish in the next month or so, um, and they'll be publicly available. And then the following eight, assuming funding um, is, is available, we're hoping to kind of get those out on a sort of rolling six monthly basis. So two at a time every six months or so. Great. Well, we'll have to draw a line under it there. Thank you very much, James. Um, and it's time to draw the session to a close. So a big thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you for your presentations and your time and your consideration around the topic of management in the Southwest. Um, the steering group for Southwest Marine Ecosystems is starting to draw together their report. And um, if you have any observations on the subject of management that you'd like to have included in that report, then please contact us via the Southwest Marine Ecosystems website. Um, so again, thank you to all, your speak uh, to all of our speakers, thank you for your time, and um, hopefully see you all next year at Southwest Marine Ecosystems 2022. Goodbye for now. <laughs>